Hello, welcome to our sustainable care conference session on the design and operation of care markets and provider innovation. I'm Catherine Needham uh, from the University of Birmingham um, and we've got a great session for you today looking at different aspects of care markets and innovation. We're going to hear from Juliet Malley from the LSE who will be talking about um, how we measure quality in relation to adult social care markets. Alistair Jones from the LSE will be talking about a case study around dementia and improving quality. And Deborah Milley from Virginia Tech will be talking about the Japanese case in relation to markets and care workers. We've got uh, Carla limpel zeet as a uh, discussant from Oxford Brooks Business School, um, and she will be bringing out the key points of the uh, presentations into a discussion at the end. So we'll start then with the presentation from Juliet Malley from the LSE. And Juliet's presentation is entitled Assuring the Quality of Adult Social Care Markets for Older People by Investing in Providers in England. Hello, my name is Juliet Malley. I'm from the Care Policy and Evaluation Centre at the London School of Economics. I'm going to present our paper on the shaping the quality of adult social care markets for older people by investing in providers in England. So this paper comes from a slightly larger study that was funded by the NIHR School for Social Care Research, um, which was exploring local authority strategies for assuring and improving quality in uh, care markets. Uh, so as part of this study, we conducted three process evaluations of different initiatives across three local authority sites in England. Each of the co-authors led one of those evaluations, but this paper itself is a synthesis of the findings from across those three evaluations, looking in particular at what we learned from those studies about how to assure and improve quality in the context of, uh, of market shaping. So if we move on to the uh, next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that market shaping duty uh, and what it means in the context of this study. Um, so uh, we look at this issue of improving and ensuring quality from the perspective of local government. Now, in England, as in many other countries, local, go local government has quite an important role to play in uh, social care markets. And that role uh, changed slightly in terms of its shape with the introdu introduction in 2014 uh, under the CARE Act of this market shaping duty, where local authorities were then required to ensure a diversity of good quality provision for everyone in their local area. So this kind of extends their um, responsibility really from being concerned with just the publicly funded uh, users also to having a concern for the people who are self-funding their care in their local areas. So kind of reaching out now to providers who they might not have been in contact with before um, because those providers only provide care to uh, self-funders. Um, but there are quite, really quite a lot of questions around this market shaping duty and what it means with respect to assuring and improving quality and that role that local authorities have in their market around quality. So the first question is that really this market shaping duty is really a strategic uh, in, intent really. It doesn't say very much uh, in the guidance, there isn't very much guidance about how it should be implemented operationally within local authorities and local authorities have quite a lot of questions around how they should actually be implementing this role. The second question is that it's very unclear how this duty fits alongside the commissioning role um, that is really the kind of bedrock, I suppose, of how local authorities have engaged with uh, historically uh, providers. And a key part of that commissioning role is really the procurement and contracting cycle, which is particularly important for older people because the majority of uh, care for these older people is really still purchased via local authorities there hasn't been a huge take up of cash payments among, old, among older people. So that procurement commissioning cycle is quite important. So this study is really developed in, in that light, trying to understand those two questions which we've outlined here, really in the framework of this being an exploratory study. So with our goal being to try and understand from what local authorities are doing, kind of gain some answers to these questions of, what policy instruments do local authorities use to assure and improve quality in the context of market shaping? And how should these instruments be designed, implemented and bundled together into uh, instrument mixes? 
So as you see, we draw on this concept of policy instrument and the policy instrument literature, and what we mean by policy instrument is really the kind of levers, mechanisms or tools that uh, local authorities can use to produce change. And we examine these questions in the light of the contracting and uh, commissioning uh, literatures, in particular drawing on ideas of relational contracting and, and trust. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, um, if we look at the, I just want to give you a bit of background to the case study sites that we were looking at. So we chose the case studies because they were looking at different initiatives. So you can see here, case study one, we were looking at a voluntary accreditation scheme, the financial incentive. In case study two, um, they were revising their contracting approaches, revising the standards, the way they do the monitoring and enforcing uh, their standards, uh, people are monitoring, keeping up those standards. In case study three, we have this quite unique, uh, we think, really offer that the local authority uh, was giving. It was a what we call a facilitation approach where the local authority um, was really providing you know, hands-on support um, to any provider in its area to improve quality. So that was good providers, but also providers that were in more difficulty. As you can see, all the authorities were fairly rural councils, um, all had a pretty problematic workforce situation, but no different to the national situation in that respect. But we had quite a lot of variability in terms of political control, deprivation, and the numbers of people that um, were receiving these cash benefits, these uh, direct payment users. So case study three is high in that regard. So if we move on to the next slide, and here we start to talk through the results from the study. Um, so we began by trying to understand um, the sort of strategy that local authorities had with respect to assuring and improving quality. And interestingly, none of them had an explicit strategy in this regard, but all of them were able to identify clear strategic goals with respect to strategy, and all of them identified the same goals, I think is the, the key point that I, want, that I want to present here around managing risk and reputation, encouraging and recognising good quality, and the third one being these better relationships with providers, which is very clearly linked to the ideas of the CARE Act. All of them were articulating these three goals. But if we move to the next slide, which shows you the instrument mixes that were apparent across the, or that we identified across the three sites, we see that despite the fact they had a very similar set of strategic goals that they were all articulating, actually operationally they were very, very different in terms of what was going on. So this is a small slide, so I'll just highlight a few things for you here. So case study two, you can see, had a much uh, less uh, diverse instrument mix. In terms of what it was doing, it was purely focused around its contracting cycle. Um, whereas case study one and two, not only did, have they, did they have something around contract, so case study one and three, not only did they have something around contracting, they also had voluntary accreditation schemes and they additionally had these learning related offers. More diverse in case study three because we also had a facilitation offer in addition to the training that uh, case study one was offering. Um, what we found really interesting though when we started to look at how local how providers were responding to the instrument mix and how they viewed their relationship with the local authorities was that we saw a pattern emerging whereby case study three which had the most diverse mix was seen as most supportive whereas case study two which had the least diverse mix was seen as not very supportive at all and, and case study one was kind of somewhere in between so i want to spend the rest of the presentation trying to explain why we think it was that there was this pattern that emerged and what it is about the instrument mix that might be uh, implying a kind of difference in, in the relationship between the local authorities and the providers. So if we move on to the next slide, this really tries to summarise um, the, the instrument mix that we saw in sort of more visual terms and hopefully try to highlight why is the different elements of the mix um, induce a sort of different set of relationships between local authorities and providers. So what we found across the sites, we've kind of structured the different types of mix around three aspects. So we had the contracting schemes, we had the voluntary accreditation schemes, and we had these learning related offers. Now, the contracting and voluntary accreditation schemes are rules-based approaches, really. So what that means is that they load the providers with more requirements, more costs, essentially. They imply a lack of trust in the provider in the sense that you have to specify things very, very explicitly to ensure that they're going to carry out the 
uh, requirements as you set out in the contract. Um, and because of that, they're seen quite negatively um, by providers. Um, in contrast, the learning-related offers have a totally different underlying philosophy to them, really. Um, you know, they're, they, they're about giving providers support and help. Um, they imply, therefore, a kind of sense of goodwill, really, a sense of commitment to the relationship that providers really recognise and respond to in, in that way. People talk about them as, as gifts. But I think the important thing to note here is really that kind of sense of goodwill and trust that develops by making this investment. Um, we talk about them as investment approaches in, in the providers. So the other thing that we really noticed was that it mattered how the um, rules-based approaches were implemented, just how they were seen by providers. Um, so where the we found that the they could be seen in a kind of or they could be done in a sort of arm's length adversarial manner or a much more supportive manner and the extent to which they were done seemed to be do, done in a more supportive man, a manner depended on the extent to which they were linked to these elements in the green circles so where there was more communication kind of open door for questions um, business meetings um, this was seen much more positively um, uh, equally where there was support so you know making sure that there was structured feedback kind of hands-on facilitation approach this was seen as much more positive these were seen in much more positive light and what we found then is that these kind of supports um, these kind of positive supportive noises really counteracted a lot of the kind of negativity and sense of distrust um, that arose from the more rules-based approaches. Equally, these rules-based approaches could be um, linked with um, kind of the elements that are in the dark blue circles, so the financial incentives, publicly reported awards and, and, and rating schemes. Um, now, the reason that local authorities do this is to kind of increase goal alignment, make sure everyone's moving in the same direction. But what we found is these don't really have a kind of obvious positive or negative impact on the way that the um, schemes are seen. They can be positive where there's a kind of reputational benefit to them, but they can also be seen very negatively by providers where it's felt that they're not really able to attain um, the, the goals that are being set because they're just way beyond what, what, what they could do and there's no support being offered to attain them. So they have a much more ambiguous uh, relationship uh, role with respect to determining the relationship between the local authority and the providers. Okay, so if we um, move to the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit more about you know, why it was that we saw these kind of different instrument mixes develop, despite the fact that you know, local authorities seem to have very similar strategic goals. So what is it holding back the local authorities from developing this much broader, more diverse mix? Why are we seeing it in some places and, and not in others? And we think that this really comes down to something that has been written about quite a lot before in the sort of commissioning, social care commissioning literature, you know, really around the fact that this is an area where ideology and the expectation of providers kind of interacts with uh, the reality of, of what's going on in the ground. And there wasn't really necessarily an alignment between all these things going on. So one thing that we noticed was that local authorities really recognised, all of them recognised, that providers were in very challenging circumstances and that had an effect on their ability to you know, assure and improve quality in their areas. But the way they put in place their initiatives didn't necessarily recognise this at all and could sometimes make things worse by you know, loading more requirements, giving them greater costs, making things more difficult for them. The other thing that we saw was that on the local authorities, all the staff um, were, recon you know, were recognising different kind of variety of motivations that providers had. So see them as a business, slightly profit motivated, need to take responsibility for their own improvement, but also recognising that they're a group of caring professionals doing their best in difficult circumstances. Now the problem seemed to be that although there was this mix of recognition that providers had different motivations, um, 
one, the kind of business perspective often seemed to dominate in, in well, the two areas that were seen as less supportive. And that was kind of crowding out um, this uh, more sort of, as a more supportive approach developing with the, in the areas. So what we suggest is that there's really two different approaches um, that local authorities can end up sort of taking um, towards intervening in markets. One being a much more pragmatic and supportive approach that, you know, is embedded within this idea of, um, you know, a collective of caring professionals that is realistic about the capacity and capabilities of providers. And another one which is a kind of much more minimal and unsupportive approach where what you're doing is designing initiatives that, you know, minimally intervene and are really just about identifying what Julian Legrand referred to as the kind of knaves out there. Um, Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, and I'll try and wrap up a little, little bit more. So I guess the real question for us came as to why it was that local authority, the, the third side, was able to, uh, you know, balance, in a sense, um, this positive, uh, sort of supportive approach alongside this kind of much more minimal, unsupportive approach. How were they able to have both uh, in operation at the same time? Why was that working there but not really working in another place? Um, and the key thing that we thought was really important for this was that in Site 3, it really seemed to be um, that this happened because um, the unsupportive approach was found within the contracting team and they, you know, they were separated from a different team, the quality team, that was driving forward these uh, much more supportive approaches. Um, whereas in Site 1, although again we saw this kind of mix with some supportive approaches and some unsupportive, less supportive approaches, actually they were all being carried out by the same team uh, so, effectively, in the end, you know, the, the supportive approach is being crowded out because they just didn't have the resources and the time to do both of these things. Um, and, and, you know, even though, actually, it's like people inside one were telling us they much preferred to do the supportive things, they were being crowded out by the need to do the contracting, essentially. And as we saw in Site, one, uh, site 2, they'd really moved away from doing any, anything supportive at all. But I think it's important to emphasise, and this is what this slide does around engineering constructed dialogue, that actually it's really important to have both of these approaches here because they do different things. Um, and so I think that's really where the kind of value of the site three's approach is and that it allowed this kind of constructive dialogue to emerge between these two seen, teams that were seen as equals. Um, so the reason why you want to have both of these approaches in place is if you move towards too supportive an approach, then you know you potentially get kind of too cosy uh, with the providers and you lose that kind of sense of objectivity. Um, whereas if you move to doing something that's too minimal, too unsupportive, you know relations become too adversarial, too adversarial, and you don't get the kind of positive outcomes that, that you really need um, from these relationships. Okay, so if we turn to the final slide, and I'll just wrap up in terms of our conclusions and uh, implications. So I think what we developed in this study was really a set of kind of three propositions um, about how local authorities might be kind of developing their approaches to assuring improving quality uh, with, within their local markets. So the first one is that we felt that what mattered for supporting positive relationships between local authorities and providers is the instrument mix. So it must balance approaches that signal distrust, such as monitoring, with those that signal trust and build goodwill, such as offering this solution-oriented advice and facilitating change. The second proposition that we have is that to implement an effective instrument mix, local authorities need to balance minimal, unsupportive approaches with pragmatic, supportive perspectives. And we suggest that this might be most effectively achieved where the functions are managed within separate teams that are seen as equals um, within the organisation. And the third proposition from this work is that an instrument mix that includes investment-oriented approaches is going to help local authorities to assure and raise quality across care markets because these instruments are generally not dependent on contracting relationships. 
Okay, so I mean these propositions are based on studies within the study within three sites, um, and we didn't have any London boroughs, any small authorities as part of this. So obviously there is a question about replication of these findings and the theoretical propositions that we set out here. Another question that we have is really around exploring the costs. Of, of these different approaches. Um, I think it would be quite interesting to do some kind of economic analysis around this to really kind of get underneath that question. The other kind of implication I think there is from this work is um, the fact that, you know, what we really found was this kind of emergent sort of strategy developing this area. Nowhere was it explicit. There wasn't a kind of centre for strategy in this area. And I think this kind of points to some of the limitations of approaches to thinking about market shaping that are based in a sort of more strategic planning school type of thinking, um, you know, where you sort of gather information and you do everything in a kind of rational uh, manner. Um, you know, the market positioning statements would be, would be part of that. If there is no, if there is no strategic centre, that becomes very difficult to, to understand how that can be carried out. The second point around this, I think, shown through this work, is when you're looking at this strategy that's kind of much more emergent, is the, really the importance of uh, making sure that you study the strategic action um, by looking at the behaviour of actors across varying levels of the organisation, as we did in this study, to really understand how that strategy emerges and develops. And I think finally, we'd just like to suggest that you know this study really demonstrates, given austerity, and COVID, it's really a kind of timely reminder, I think, of the importance of these more investment-oriented approaches and the cost, really, potentially, of withdrawing such approaches at these times that are actually there signalling trust, signalling building goodwill with providers that we really need in order to overcome the types of challenges that the sector is having right now and will have in, in many years to come, likely as a, as a result of, of the you know, past year or 10 years, really of uh, austerity. So thank you very much. If you just present, see the final slide, just uh, the usual disclaimer and the NIHR. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Next, we'll hear from one of Juliet's colleagues, uh, Alistair Jones from the LSE. So Alistair is working on the same um, broad project as Juliet, but it's bringing out a different aspect uh, of that piece of work, focusing in particular on support for dementia care so Alice's presentation will be meeting dementia care needs through market shaping. Hi there, my name's Alistair Jones uh, and I'm from the LSE's Department of Methodology and today I'm going to be presenting a paper meeting dementia care needs through market shaping, a process evaluation of a standards based dementia care payment scheme in England. Uh, and I'm, this is a paper um, co-authored with colleagues Juliet Malley and Valentina Zigante uh, from the Care Policy and Evaluation Centre at the LSE. So next slide, please. Just for a quick bit of background, uh, this paper speaks to one of three case studies from the wider uh, NIHR SSCR funded ELSQA study. And ELSQA uh, stands for an exploration of local authority strategies and initiatives to improve the quality of social care for older people in England through market shaping. Uh, this study came about because we observed that through the, the, the CARE Act 2014, local authorities are required to make sure that high quality care services are available in their area. But we observed that there was a paucity of evidence about how local authorities were practically approaching this role. And this raised an important policy question, how can local authorities ensure that high quality care services are available in their area, both for people who pay for their own care and for users, service users that are funded by those local authorities. Uh, to look at this question, we designed a three-phase study. This involved mapping initiatives across England, uh, looking at some case studies from those. I'll be talking to one of those in this paper and then drawing transferable lessons um, from the evidence we generate. Uh, next slide, please. So in phase one of Elsewhere, the mapping exercise I mentioned, my colleagues conducted a systematized and iterative review and qualitative content analysis of publicly available local authority documents uh, which pertain to the assurance of social care quality um, in local authorities in England. This was primarily online documents but also snowballed into other sorts of documents that we uh, were able to uh, gather uh, directly from uh, local authorities in particular. The review identified a range of approaches to quality assurance and improvement 
And we categorize those broadly in relation to Bedon's uh, categorization of policy instruments as either regulatory, a sticks approach, economic and more carrots approach, or information and more kind of sermons uh, and information approach to changing behavior. Various things were unclear in the phase one data that we collected and analyzed, and this included um, questions around why the various approaches identified in the review were chosen by local authorities and how their selection uh, related to market shaping duty of local authorities. Uh, also questions around what was driving changes in the approaches taken by local authorities, what uh, implementation challenges were uh, faced by local authorities and the consequences of different approaches uh, taken uh, by local authorities at the kind of more aggregate level. And these are some of the things that we went on um, to explore. Next slide, please. In phase two of L Square, uh, we conducted a series of process evaluations, so three process evaluations of three different uh, case studies. And this phase was designed to explore some of these issues that arose in phase one that I mentioned. Uh, we wanted to learn about the different approaches taken by local authorities, thinking about implications for how we might replicate those approaches, and also think about how we can um, feed back to the authorities uh, with whom we, did, we conducted these case studies. We also wanted in this phase to synthesize findings across case studies to look at kind of think about implications for broader lessons for practice and policy as well. To do the case studies, we purposefully selected three local authority and care quality assurance approach case studies from those mapped out in phase one. And my colleague, Juliet Malley at this conference will be talking about a paper that looks kind of more broadly at the three case studies uh, mentioned. So that may be of interest. The case studies uh, were selected to capture a range of care quality assurance approaches that were shown to be prominent in phase one. And also we, we did this purpose of selection in relation to the kind of categories I mentioned earlier. Um, so the first case study was a local authority that took an education and knowledge exchange approach to assuring a high quality social care. The second case study was a local authority that used a regulation, a directions and surveillance specifically approach. And the third local authority, which I'll be talking about in today's paper, uh, used a mixed approach. So it combined uh, regulatory aspects um, around kind of volunteering into the scheme concerned, economic aspects, there was a, a financial incentive involved in the scheme, and an educational aspect, there was a facilitation uh, dimension to this uh, intervention as well. Next slide, please. So in this uh, third case study, uh, which is the focus of today's uh, presentation, we looked at a dementia care payment scheme that had been developed and was being implemented by a local authority um, in England. So this scheme, this dementia care payment or DCP as I refer to it, was designed to encourage nursing and residential care home providers to adopt evidence-based standards in relation to dementia care payment practice in the care environment and it involved the reimbursement of those providers for the additional costs of providing such, uh, such care. So uh, care providers would apply to be accredited based on the standards of their social care for people with, with dementia, and there was a, a financial incentive uh, for doing so, a reimbursement. So in brief, the, the, the scheme comprised accreditation against evidence-based standards. So care providers were invited to apply for their services to be accredited in order to be able to uh, receive the dementia care payment. It comprised a financial incentive, the reimbursement through the dementia care payment for the additional costs of providing higher quality dementia care once accredited. And it comprised facilitation. So there was a, a support, a kind of suite of support offered by the local authority to assist providers with meeting and sustaining the standards that were required uh, to be accredited and so to receive the dementia care payment. So these are the three kind of core um, components of this particular scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So broadly, in terms of the process evaluation we took, uh, this can be divided into two phases itself. The first of these was to, uh, first of all, summarise the key elements of the intervention, which I've just mentioned, to try and understand the purpose or the rationale of the dementia care payment. Why was the local authority taking this approach? to describe the intervention in detail and its causal assumptions. Uh, in doing so, we, we created a validated logic model where we thought about the inputs, activities, outcomes, and wider impacts of the dementia care payment scheme. And then through that 
process to identify research questions um, for the evaluation that followed. So in this first phase, we did five interviews with local authority staff, a review of local authority documents about the dementia care payment scheme uh, and a literature review as well. And then in the second uh, phase of this process evaluation, we wanted to understand the role of context in shaping the implementation of the dementia care payment. So thinking about differential take up outcomes and impacts and so on. And we wanted to think about other potential challenges to implementation. So think about the policy, strategic and operational context and trying to interpret implementation assumptions uh, using relevant theoretical literature. And in this part of the process evaluation, we did seven interviews with local authority staff and providers. We also conducted a, a large uh, provider survey where we were interested in uh, broader provider um, experience perceptions uh, of the survey and what it meant for them and whether they took it and uh, whether they went for the dementia care payment and so on. We looked at local authority data and we looked and we conducted a further literature review as well. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the evaluation framework for this kind of phase two part, we were interested in when how and under what circumstances the dementia care payment led to improvements in the quality of care um, for care home residents with dementia. The intervention we're looking at um, is complex and in the process evaluation method, we're kind of taking a theory-based approach. So we're trying to map the practical theory, um, the kind of um, the informal theory around how the dementia care payment is, is meant to work, what, what's meant to happen, and our study is looking at trying to test that theory, is that actually what happened um, in practice. So there are some broad aims to process evaluation, kind of trying to want to understand the functioning of an intervention by looking at implementation, uh, mechanisms of impact, how the intervention has impacts and contextual factors. I'm going to be looking in detail at mechanisms of impact, given this is quite a short presentation um, later on in this presentation. And we used theory, which we drew from the uh, program implementation literature to gain insight into the implementation of this uh, dementia care payment and the mechanisms of impact, how it had impacts. OK, next slide, please. So just looking at this in a bit more detail, the key components of the implementation of the evaluation, excuse me, were in implementation focusing on what was delivered in terms of the quantity and quality of the intervention and how the intervention was delivered. So what resources and activities were necessary to achieve full implementation, how much staff time and so on. We looked at mechanisms of impact, how uh, the mechanisms linking an intervention activities and outputs to outcomes. And that's what I'll focus on now. And we also looked at context. So how the context in which an intervention is delivered dementia care payment affects both what is implemented and how uh, outcomes are achieved. Next slide, please. So let's look at the mechanisms of impact in a bit more detail. And here I'm going to look at desired outcomes and also externalities. So overall, the providers and local authorities describe this as quite a positive experience being part of the dementia care payment. So the local authority said it was time consuming, but overall a positive experience. And indeed, the providers reported that they had a good understanding of the scheme, uh, seeing it as being one to raise standards of dementia care and um, as a mechanism to recognise high quality dementia care. There was a consensus that the D dementia care payment was a worthwhile initiative. Um, all, provide, all survey providers agreed or strongly agreed with this statement, although providers that um, had actually applied were more likely to do this. So there was some uh, confirmation bias involved in that. There was also interesting uh, mechanisms around workforce. So providers reported to us a sense of pride or achievement of being accredited for the dementia care payment. And this translated into staff satisfaction. We were, people reported how their staff were buzzing when they got the accreditation. Um, and this contribution, this kind of role of actually earning a dementia care payment rather than it being something that's just given was also framed in, in relation to a broader sense of the importance of recognition for the social care sector, uh, which is um, which was perceived by the, our interviewees and as in the providers and local authorities as an undervalued sector. So there's important kind of morale aspects to um, the scheme. Seventy four percent of providers uh, were motivated, reported being motivated to apply for the recognition of work done by the home. 
I think it's recognition of staff, it's really important for staff morale as well, as one provider put it to us. Next slide, please. There are also desired outcomes that were met in terms of continuous improvement and organisational learning. So um, providers re report, so this is talking to a manager of a chain of providers, how the, the uh, care homes they managed in those care homes, there was a, they could see the improvement through getting the dementia care payment and that, that home were thinking about the process, um, thinking about the, the AA processes they're applying in the home to improve and assure high quality social care. As one provider put it, when we applied, it made us look more closely at the service we provide and enabled us to look at all areas and improve the service we already already provided. So it did have this continuous improvement um, impact. We also saw some normalizations of standards of dementia care in chains, but also throughout homes. Um, and uh, there was a kind of focus there on uh, the activities in standards involved in the standards that were accredited and informing practices across care homes among carers, housekeepers, cleaners, caterers. So there were wide scale impacts as these uh, standards of dementia care were normalised. There are also unintended pathways, however, or externalities. One of these being um, that within the local authority, there is actually some organisational learning around dementia and mental capacities. As, a, as a one interview we put it, we keep on learning um, and you keep learning through this process. So there was this positive um, externality here and also improved record keeping by providers. They started to see it as really important to keep their records and some reported improved relationships with providers. In other cases, there were some negative externalities, though, and some uh, providers reported weakened perceptions of the team managing the dementia care payment because that team was associated with other things um, like safeguarding. And so there were these tensions around that. And one even reported it that the dementia care payment accreditation was worse than the CQC visit. So there were lots of different mechanisms um, of impact. And that's just a brief overview. These mechanisms of impact sit within a broader set of themes and I've mapped these out here. So this is part of our broader study, just so you can see the kind of broader study um, that we're doing. Thank you very much for your time. It's a brief overview um, of the mechanisms of impact um, of this study. It's been a pleasure talking at this um, conference and I look forward very much to seeing other talks. Uh, thank you very much. If you have general inquiries about the study, please contact my colleague, Juliet Malley, who was the PI, uh, and I've given her contact details here. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Hello, everybody. My name is Claire Charlton. I am Head of Extra Care for Housing 21 and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some investment work we did in our care workforce in order to improve the standards of the care service that we deliver and also to improve our position as being an employer of choice. Next slide please. Um, this is the normal bit of data input here about us as an organisation. We are the leading extra care provider in England. Uh, we've got a staff team of well over 3,000 in our care workforce and we deliver about 44,000 hours of care per week across 80 odd care services. Next slide please. So back in 2017 we did some survey work, we did some thinking, we had lots of feedback and whilst we weren't in a bad place, it wasn't the best place that we thought we should be in. Um, we had a, a, a turnover amongst our care workforce of about 25% per year, which isn't too bad against the sector, but it, we wanted to be better than that. Our staff satisfaction was below 90% um, among the care workforce and care workers regularly reported to us that they didn't always feel supported at work. Um, they felt isolated sometimes, um, unsure sometimes of what to do in an emergency. 90% um, of our services were graded as good by CQC, which again beats the sector average, but we, again, we wanted to be better than that. Um, resident satisfaction was okay, about 85% nationally. Um, and like every other provider, we were struggling with low rates from low charge rates from some local authorities, which sometimes affected the financial viability of our services. 
um, we reviewed our position and we decided that we needed to take some action to value our workforce and to improve our services. Next slide, please. So in response to um, the situation, and apologies, this is quite a wordy slide. Um, I hope that the conference providers will be able to share the presentations with you. Um, the, big, the biggest gripe for our care workers was pay. So we decided to um, become more than a minimum wage employer. And we set our pay rates for staff, for care workers staff at 10% above minimum wage as a minimum, where we get a better charge rate from local authorities, our care workers get paid more than 10% above the minimum wage. We also aligned our weekday rates with our weekend rates, and, and we didn't do that by reducing the weekend rates, we did it by increasing the weekday rates. We do still have an enhancement for overnight staff. Um, the second big issue for care workers was about certainty of work and you will all know that the sector is renowned for being a zero hours employment sector. So we replaced um, those zero hours contracts with guaranteed hours for our care workers. And 70% of our care worker staff are now on guaranteed hours. The remaining 30% are true bank staff. Um, we listened to what, this, what our care workers were telling us about a lack of support. Um, and what our senior care workers were telling us about a lack of accountability and responsibility for them. And so we um, removed the senior care worker role and introduced a new layer of manager, um, an assistant care manager post, which um, has its own development pathway. It's a salaried role. The um, assisted care managers do not need to spend a lot of time delivering care, which senior care workers used to have to do. Um, as well as the development pathway for the assistant care managers, we invested in training pathways for, for our workforce right across the piece so that everybody has a personal development pathway, which allows them either to become even better at what they're already very good at or indeed to think about career ambitions longer term. Um, <clears throat> the increase in management on schemes means that we're now able to offer a 7D management presence across all of our extra care services, which is really welcomed by residents and their family members, as well as our care work workforce. Um, we recognise that people often drop into care, not by choice, but because it appears to be the only option available. So we've really set out to change the face of care work by campaigning um, to recognise care as a career a real career choice that has a massive positive positive impact both for our workers and for our residents. We introduced a care worker forum on scheme regionally and nationally so that our care workforce get heard um, and when we heard them and we listened to them as well as the big things that we fixed like pay and guaranteed hours we also fixed small things which can have an impact on how you feel at work. So we changed the uniforms into something more um, comfortable and professional looking for our staff. Every scheme has a water cooler. Every member of staff has a water bottle. We have free tea and coffee milk refreshments for our care workers. All those things have been valued and welcomed, even though they're relatively small. Alongside that, we, we wanted to recognise and reward Everybody in our workforce, we know that they always go the extra mile and we know that they always do the right thing. So we now have a reward and recognition programme where we can publicly value people and praise them when they've done something exceptionally well. Um, this is the campaign that we did in, in terms of trying to um, make care work a career and a value and these are real care workers there are real care workers and these are real quotes from them when we surveyed them about what have you done today um this was a great success it resulted in um a lot of interest in people coming to work for us we we advertised on the back of buses we did um videos and blogs and and it's been a great success as well as a real 
recognition of these people who are on this on your screens right now. Um, so this was back in 2018, 2019 that we made all these changes and, and we look back now and say, um, what did we achieve? Well, so our care satisfaction for care workers is now at 92% and 96% of those care workers say they are committed to housing 21 long term. Care worker turnover has reduced to 17%, which we are really pleased with. It continues to show a downward trend. Our current target is to get the 15% turnover and I'm sure that once we get there in the coming year, then we'll set a new target for 10%. Our resident satisfaction with care work, with care services has increased to 97%, which is brilliant. Um, and we now have 9% of our care services, which are rated as outstanding by CQC. Um, some of our other services, 81% of them are rated as good. And that's not because they don't deliver an outstanding service of care, it's because they haven't been inspected recently. Um, we believe that we've demonstrated to our local authority partners that by investing in our staff and investing in their training improves the quality of services and outcomes to our residents. We are still working on the charge rate issue, as I'm sure lots of other providers are. We also continue an ongoing listening project to our care workforce and we've introduced a range of working groups and initiatives and projects to make work better. Um, we focus around mental health, well-being, diversity and uh, diversity, equality and inclusion, training. We recognise people by telling them they're awesome. We were really proud to achieve a really shiny gold with investors in people a couple of years ago and we're now working towards platinum. Um, we recognise these are all building blocks on our journey to be the best that we possibly can be um, and we're still working on things because we do we still think we can get better um next slide please that's it from me thank you for listening um always happy to share more of our experience and i'm sure the conference organizers will share the slides thank you so we'll now move on to our discussant who is carla zimple leal from oxford brooks business school who will bring out some of the key aspects of that presentation that's great. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank, thank you all presenters for fantastic uh, introduction of uh, market shaping and all the uh, presentations. It was really fascinating to watch all of them. Um, I would like just to perhaps summarize my understanding of, of the presentations and then pose some questions that we can hopefully discuss at the end. So um, Juliet's presentation begins with this criticism that local authorities in England have the market shaping role uh, to ensure good quality for adult social care alongside other roles like the financing of care uh, and commissioning of care. But there is little advice on how to implement this market shaping role for care providers. So she presented the results of three case studies with local authorities and care providers um, that although they were having the same uh, strategic goals, they had different operational setting or setups and a different uh, mix of policy instruments on how they supported the, um, the care providers. So the main conclusions were that the approach is based around um, monitoring the standards and rules, signal this distrust with the providers. But investment-oriented approaches and instruments, um, like, for example, the facilitation of interventions uh, and training, promoted trust. So she and her colleagues suggest that local authorities should be somewhere in the middle and have neither a too cozy or too adversarial, as, as she put it, approach to uh, this relationship with providers. Uh, and one of the case studies demonstrated that middle ground by building this uh, more constructive dialogue between the quality team and the contract team. And I think Alistair there goes further into this, this third case study, which is brilliant because it's nice to hear more about it. So um, I think the work is, is very good and timely reminder of the value of this investment oriented approach uh, for market shaping. So the main question is how do we get these local authorities to shape the quality of the care markets and work with providers with this right mix of control, monitoring and investing? I know that Catherine done a lot of work 
uh, and she actually provided the, the four different models of market shaping that local authorities use. So perhaps that's something that could be linked to that. And also around the, the teams, um, you know, each 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 provider, each each uh, team would be very different. So how do you design for different contexts as well? And then there's the issue around self-funders. How do local authorities shape the care markets for them? Because my understanding is that they still have that responsibility, but it's almost like self-funders run a parallel market. So I think the investment-oriented approach is probably the best to build this goodwill and are generally more effective than monitoring. But uh, it would be interesting to learn more about that, uh, your, view, your views on those. Um, because, of course, we're talking about policy to business communication, but at, in the end, it's all about human relationships. So I'm not, I, I don't know if necessarily more carrot and less stick is better, but perhaps more autonomy would be a, a better way forward. Uh, then Alistair goes deeper into case study three and uh, presents this process evaluation uh, for an intervention in a local authority and dementia care providers. So obviously the, the whole aim was to improve the standards of dementia care. And um, the case study is an initiative implemented by the local authority. And it was based not only on the financial incentive, but also uh, on a regulatory and an education incentive. So providers would receive an accreditation to adopt this uh, evidence-based standard to practice dementia care and would be reimbursed uh, for any additional costs to provide such care. So overall, it, it seemed to have a very positive outcomes for both the local authorities and the provider uh, and also improved dementia care for, for the recipient. So really, win-win-win. So I thought it was really interesting that this scheme also had a positive impact uh, in the workforce with a sense of achievement for being accredited and also the organizational learning. So the providers that adopted this scheme actually learn more about other schemes that they because they had to look into their organizational practices. So it was very good to look closer at those other services. Uh, so I would like to hear more about which context the interventions were delivered and how that affected the implementation of these schemes. Because it would be actually interesting to understand the, the, the process of the intervention, uh, where there were failures along the way, what were they and, and how did they happen? And one of the questions that came to mind when I was listening to him uh, is why, why, did, why did they think that this particular scheme was so successful? And could it be that because it was focused on a very specific practice of dementia care, so um, could, could that be the reason why this uh, kind of triad of policy of sticks, carrots and behavior uh, worked well? Or, uh, or, or, or is something different? Um, and one of the positive unintended consequences that he talked about was the improved relationship among providers, which is great. Uh, and then from my own research, in the, in more in the self-funding market, this unintended consequence is actually one of the main goals of the providers. So is the other way around uh, that, that is happened. And then we move into Deborah, which takes us to the other side of the world and looks at the Japanese immigration policy to attract the skilled care workers and how those change over the years. So the whole aim is to facilitate the, the, the visa and how employers promoted different methods to retain the workforce, uh, which I think we have a lot to learn here in the UK uh, from that system, especially now with all the transition we're going through. Um, so, the employers promoted these different methods um, that um, improved the work conditions, the skills development opportunities, the promotion system, they um, uh, provided scholarship loans. So, uh, and they also started to work directly with institutions abroad to facilitate that transition so uh, migrant workers could come uh, easier. So my first question would be how well these incentives worked to attract the immigrant care workers to Japan. And uh, to a certain extent, some providers here in the UK do a similar approach. So when I work with um, living care providers, they recruited directly from European countries. So they had facilities there 
and they would be uh, helping workers on traveling, working visas and so on. And I was also wondering if local authorities work with providers to attain this skilled workforce from abroad, in what sense, or is mainly, do they have any role or is mainly the private providers um, that, that have that kind of role? So and from a market shaping perspective, offering scholarships, creating, you know, care workers registries, introducing this promotion system, would, that, would this be effective mechanisms uh, to attract and retain the workforce to ensure the diversity and quality, which is the role of local authorities? So if uh, Catherine would like to join me, um, we could perhaps uh, pinpoint. So I don't know if that made any sense of what I said. Catherine, you, you know a lot more. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Carla. That was really interesting. Um, so we haven't got uh, Juliet, Alistair on the live chat. Yes. Um, um, hopefully there's ways to work. we can engage them um, when this goes live, because I think there's a really some really interesting detailed questions about their particular studies. But I think some of the broader issues around uh, kind of relationships in this sort of, well, it's not it's more than a triad, isn't it? There's so many different actors involved. But I guess you could think about kind of local government providers and people using services or and the care workers um, within the providers there's, there's the sort of it's about the relationships between these different actors um, yeah. and I think what I, one of the things I took from uh, from Juliet's presentation your commentary is about this question of kind of can you be too relational or can mm -hmm. what, uh, what are the kind of risks of high trust relationships so I think in our work on market shaping we generally um, saw more trust as always being a good thing but I did I, I was struck by Juliet's point about this notion of sort of too excessive coziness between providers and potentially and commissioners and that, that actually that isn't always the best way to get good quality um, support for people um, yeah. because you do also make sure you've got a strong voice for for people using services um, and yeah. for the care workers themselves whose, whose interests are not necessarily represented by the, the providers so I do think that's a kind of that's an interesting a sort of set of, of kind of questions so I suppose for me it's about trust is really important but it's got to be trust um, kind of multi-dimensional trust which allows voice for all the all the relevant stakeholders rather yeah. than um, a, a sort of assuming that this is just about kind of building excessively cozy relationships between um, between providers and um, and the commissioners if that's local government um, so yeah I think that's a really interesting uh, yeah, the question. I, I mean, I mean but would you perform that kind of initiative in every single setting? That's why I thought the context was very important, isn't it? I mean, would you have, a, you know, all of them working with every single provider? I mean, it, it really, because I think the, the, the third one worked well because it was so specific about dementia care. So that, that very close relationship worked well and, you know, it was successful. But perhaps for a more general kind of uh, initiative, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be that, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the, the real strength of Alice's presentation is taking us into the specifics, because it is quite hard yeah. to talk about these things in a general way, because the context is so important, as you say, and, and so variable. Um, and I thought the, you know, that dementia care example was a really good one, partly because of the sort of works through detail about how it, it was actually operationalized and some of the unintended consequences, because it wasn't, a wholly positive experience clearly there were some some issues around um yes. sort of administrative burden that it that it created um and the kind of the length of time it got to sort of get set up um but i thought it really did show how you can it's that sort of concept of earned autonomy isn't it that if you kind of uh show as a provider that you're kind of willing to work with a local authority to instigate certain kinds of quality checks then that brings yeah. all sorts of benefits to providers around more money and um, and that, that ability to, to, to have more autonomy. So I think that's a really a great model that would be really interesting to, to, to look at exploring um, more yeah. widely, really. Yeah. Yes, because you talked a lot about partnership model, right, with local authorities. That was one of the, your four kind of you know, partnerships, open market, uh, what's the other one, manage market and and partnerships yeah, yeah. so I, th I think they're kind of going around with the same kind of conclusions i guess uh 
but perhaps slightly more into the organizational level of the mechanisms that the different providers use, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Carla's referring to work that we did uh, at Birmingham around market shaping, and I think this whole concept of market shaping is really interesting because it's embodied in the Care Act 2014, as Juliet explained. And so there have been a few studies now looking at kind of well, what does it actually mean to shape a market? Is local government good at shaping markets? Because we know that the the state has often struggled to engage effectively with the market. So I think there's a real interesting set of questions around. How does the state work effectively as a, as a market shaper, um, which we can sort of see in the, the Japanese case as well? Um, yeah. There's one thing I wanted to, to, um, to think about from Alistair's case, and I wondered, Carla, if this linked to, to some of the work that you've done as part of the sustainable care program was around this notion of sort of thin management structures within providers. Is that you, have, you do need a bit of management infrastructure to make some of these things work, like the um, the dementia support scheme was that I think did you find that in your providers that management was was very thin yes yeah so I worked with quite a few providers that had um, self-managed teams or had a very uh, kind of less hierarchical structure um, and um, but that takes a different kind of um, training I guess as well so they would hire people a lot more that, that were happy to work autonomously, for example, that were that had those skills, if you like, but the value it was more values based uh, rather than um, hard hard skills, if you like. Uh, but they worked very well, very very well. And actually, with examples from the recent uh, pandemic, they were the kind of the providers that had um, a quicker way of, you know, coming around and 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 answering to to the problems. Because I think one of the reasons was because they had so much autonomy to do that. So they figure out the issues much quicker and had the power to, to act uh, that it was suitable for each one of their areas. So they could personalize as well. So, um, yeah, very, I, I have very positive, um, very positive examples from that kind of team management, as you call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting because I suppose in um, in the work of uh, Alistair and Juliet, thin management is seen as a as a downside. So you've got providers that have had to make cuts and cuts and cuts, and so they've kept losing layers of staff until now. You've got this sort of sense of kind of uh, you know an organisation which is very it's a quite a traditional organisation, but it's got very um, it has little management capacity to make change. And so I yeah. suppose what you're offering is a kind of more positive ver version of that to say is rather than seeing that as a kind of set of cuts which is capacity if you start by saying how could we do self-management or think differently about autonomy then actually you could make that a sort of a more effective way of working as an organization yeah 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 it did work well for them and i think they're trying to implement that relationship with local authorities as well um because i, I work a lot with the uh, self-funding market if you like but they do work with local authorities now in that sense and i think it works quite well yeah yeah mm. Do you think it makes any difference for a large organization or small? Because I guess large organizations can often kind of use that economies of scale to have centralized management teams, whereas it's harder for smaller organizations to to you know to, to draw on external management support. So I'd be interested to know whether the organizations you work with tend to be smaller or, or larger chain type organizations. Both, both actually, and you can be scaled very, very quickly. Um, I, I don't think so. I think I think it can be used everywhere. It might not be suitable for every context, but I think the scalability can, can work quite well, quite quickly. As we have the case of Wurzog in, in the Netherlands, for example. I mean, they are fairly big now uh, in very few years, so and it works perfectly fine. So I, th I think so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and they've sort of scaled on a kind of more of a honeycomb model, haven't they, rather than a pyramid? Yes, yes, so they scale out rather than yes yeah absolutely yeah because that, that's one of the problems they have now working with local authorities for example i think to try to implement that kind of self-management in an organization that is already quite set in the traditional traditional approach is quite difficult because there's a lot of clash and, and confusion and and blurred boundaries um I, I think you have to kind of set it up as a completely new new context, new idea, if that makes a separate thing. 
I think if, when you try to, to mix both management approaches, is, it can be problematic. Yes. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Kathleen, right. what do you think we can learn about, about Japan? Because um, obviously they've been through the, the, the process of the visa and now they have this, it, it's quite strict, isn't it? The, the, the process, but fairly, I don't know, attainable, I guess. It looks that way. Um, how do you think that would sit here in our current Brexit? Do you think we can learn from them? Do you think that would work? Would local authorities be able to buy into that kind of? Or are we not there yet? <laughs> I think we, well, I don't think we're definitely not there yet. I guess because of the, the sort of turbulence of the times and the kind of political mood around immigration, I think makes may make change difficult or certainly the kind of the, the political mood if not necessarily the public mood um, but I do think learning from Japan is a really interesting um, you know approach I think because they have done what we should have done and need to do which is this mm. bigger reform of long-term care uh, care and support and brought funding into it with the levy for um, for over 40s to pay for long-term care so I know that um, Japan and Germany come up a lot in conversations about how the UK might think differently about a, a sustainable care model. So I certainly think Japan is a really interesting case. Um, I guess, uh, you know, learning from other countries is always there's always a sort of mixed uh, dimension there because of the importance of context. And certainly I think the immigration context in Japan is very different to, to the one in the UK. So the, the transferability there is maybe more limited. Um, but I certainly think, it, you know, there's lots to be learned around their approach to, to funding um, and that kind of more attention to Japan um, as a model for us would be really worth doing. I think so, yes. But even even though they have all this national structure with the immigration policies and everything, from my, my understanding is that the actual individual company went even further than, you know, than the policies and, and just directly, you know, represent themselves as, in, in different countries that they want to bring the work for. So it's quite interesting to see how they kind of structure that, right? Yeah, and again, you need to be a large company to do that. So that brings us back to that question of scale is that, you know, large uh, chain providers have possibly got the capacity to make those kind of international linkages um, and take matters into their own hands. It's much harder for a kind of a small organization to do that so I think the, the sort of variability isn't there in the capacity of providers um, to sort of yeah unilaterally um, work in that sort of way yeah absolutely so, so do you think that is the best way of this market shaping or um, kind of strategies or, or or a combination of everything depending on context and if more suitable what what, what is your view yeah, I mean, I think a combination is essential um, because of the range of different kind of things that we mean when we say social care and the range of different sorts of people who are involved in the system. So um, I'm wary of things that just involve a kind of large population level settlement for social care, because I think that some of the great advantages that have been made in social care have been around direct payments and people's capacity to commission their own services, which may not look anything like care as we kind of know it. Um, so I'm kind of, I think there's, you know, lots that need to be done through commission yeah. services at scale. We clearly need to address housing um, within that. And you can't do that in a kind of, you know, a sort of you know, lots of tiny little initiatives here and there. Housing has to be addressed in that much more strategic way across a place. Um, so yeah. I think that's why, you know, you've got to have a range of different initiatives to suit the kind of the, the sorts of aspects of care that you're we're seeking to address but um yeah certainly for me it has to be a combination of something that allows people to do small exciting things that that mean they can live the kind of life they want to live um whilst also the that kind of larger scale provision to make sure things like housing is appropriate for an aging population and the kinds of have housing choices that that people would like to make yes i agree excellent thank you <laughs> great so we will leave it there um for this session um, we look forward to, to the Q&A and taking this for, further forward um, as part of the sustainable care conference uh, thank you for joining us um, and yeah look forward to uh, to keeping the discussion going thanks thank you